Aloha and welcome to Figments on Reality Season 2, Episode 2. And today is November 8th as we broadcast live. Of course, it'll be available after that. And I'd like to wish my stepson Thomas a happy 50th birthday. Thomas was born 50 years ago in Taipei, Taiwan. What a coincidence, because guess what we're talking about today? And that's part of the reason. China, Taiwan, and the U.S., and what you think uh, I should, uh, what I think you should know. Now, my wife, Alejandra, would tell you that I've been agonizing over this show, not because it's not worthy of broadcast, broadcasting or because I don't have things to say, it, but there is so much to say the issues of the past, the history, the people, the place are all very complex and rich and interesting. <laughs> the present, on the other hand, is pretty scary and pretty darn simple. And I wanted to focus on that dangerous present. But um, first, let me give a disclaimer. I always say that figments on reality is not political and I try to avoid vitriol. I'll do that same I'll do that same thing today and not take sides between China and the US and Taiwan, but try to give a perspective that acknowledges the risk and seeks to mitigate it. A little, maybe that's a little haughty of me to think I can change the world, but what the heck, at least I'm trying. So if we're going to talk about Taiwan, you got to know a little bit about it. I can't give you the whole history, but uh, let me start by mentioning that I talked about Taiwan in my last Figments on Reality two weeks ago when I was talking about uh, acknowledging the history and not hiding it. Uh, and here are a couple of scenes from tourist stops in Taiwan on the left, uh, a poster describing headhunting from uh, some of the indigenous people of Taiwan that went on into the early 20th century. And then a depiction of a, of a political prisoner camp on Green Island down in the southeast side of the main island of Taiwan. Um, and those both uh, are important memories to me because they do present the dark side of history in a reasonable way. And they don't try to uh, hide the history. And, that is sort of typical Taiwan because it's got a very diverse history. Right now, it's part of China, as we'll acknowledge, but they had their indigenous people and language that spread in various forms throughout Asia. Uh, they had Chinese immigrants. They had Japanese immigrants and occupiers. They had Dutch. They had Spaniards. They had all kinds of influences on the island. But where we are right now is it's part of China. Um, so what? It's an island. How big can it be? It's about as big as Maryland. So that would make it the eighth smallest state in the Union. But it's got uh, almost 24 million people in the population. And that would make it the third most populous state in the Union. That tells you it's pretty densely populated in the cities. The mountains, not so much because uh, there's a very abrupt mountain range that runs down the center of the beautiful island. But it's a beautiful island with beautiful people and kind of a unique aloha spirit is what I can best compare it to that's evolved over the 40 years that I've been going to and from Taiwan. Um, and it is the uh, economically important. It's the 21st largest economy in the world. That's out of 213 that are listed at the list that I viewed. And it's important to the international order because uh, during the last 50 years or so, it has developed a robust, vibrant democracy. And now we have the complication of the fact that it's actually part of China. Um, so that's Taiwan, an island nation, beautiful people, democracy, economically important. Uh, so, so, so what's the deal? What's the problem? The problem is, and I'm going to say this uh, with absolutely purposeful hyperbole, and this is why you should care, is in my view, the end of the world could begin in Taiwan. I'm going to say that again. The end of the world could begin in Taiwan because as, plausible, as implausible as it is, it is certainly possible 
that China could attack Taiwan to force reunification, that the US could be drawn into such a conflict. And that it's certain if that happens, that it won't end well. And it could even end in nuclear conflict. Really, really. Now you can say, how can this be? And by the way, I'm not, um, this is not my first rodeo of addressing this. Uh, I have been to not just Taiwan, but China several times. And uh, again, a picture here at a, an in, a University of Beijing with some of the faculty members where we talked specifically at length in uh, Beijing about the Taiwan issue. And the point I made to them was um, you guys shouldn't care <laughs> about Taiwan because see, you have such an imbalance of power. And uh, here's how different China and Taiwan are. The landmass of China is almost 300 times bigger. The population 60 times greater. The economy 20 times greater. Okay, I'm rounding up, thanks folks. And then a, a tremendous military advantage. So why, why care about it? Why be bothered that you haven't achieved reunification yet? And I'm gonna get more to that reunification issue in a bit. But the fact of the matter is China does care and she cares a lot. And that, that this is an issue that could precipitate conflict that led to war between the US and China and even nuclear war, because it wouldn't go badly and it wouldn't go easily. So. How did we get here? What's what's the the context for this uh, flashpoint, if you will? Well, China used to mean nationalist China back before 1949. Uh, the Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists were the government, certainly that the U.S. recognized. The Mao and the communists prevailed over Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists, and the nationalists beat feet to Taiwan. As I said, Taiwan's history was diverse. They just kind of unloaded the uh, Japanese occupiers. They now had, frankly, mainland occupiers who came in and established a mainland government before 1949. But then Chiang Kai-shek and the national seat of government moved to Taipei and took over the place. Um, for some time, up until the year that Thomas was born, 1971, uh, the nationalists remained sort of the face of China. In fact, it was called the Republic of China, even though the capital was now on the small island of Taiwan. Um, in 1971, UN recognition shifted to the PRC, the People's Republic of China, Communist China. And that, that became China to the world. And the political, geopolitical importance of Taiwan began to fade and their recognition was diminished. Part of that decade long process was the normalization of relations between the US and, the main, and mainland China, the PRC, People's Republic of China. And as that occurred, they had to reach some sort of an agreement on what to, how to view the question of Taiwan. And while the history, again, I've just touched the surface of it, is complex and debatable, the bottom line is the US and China agree that Taiwan is part of China and should eventually be reunified. They also agreed that any reunification should be peaceful. And as part of a concession to the um, more conservative elements of the US government at the time, the Taiwan Relations Act was passed that actually codified and built a legal requirement for the US to ensure such a transition was peaceful and to help prepare Taiwan for its legitimate defense against any um, not peaceful attempt to reunify. Uh, so there we are. Taiwan is part of China, but it's separate and China is getting impatient with that separation. We're still committed, the US to defend, to help prepare for its defense. And uh, it's very likely that we would be drawn into it. 
So all of this sounds like sort of a, a parlor game of geopolitics or even high school argument between classmates about what clique you're in and all that. It sounds kind of silly, but it but it's not silly. And without um, legitimizing their views or endorsing them, I'll say it's certainly not silly to China. This is a big deal, a core interest. I, I understand it, but why? escapes me still. This is a big deal to China, and it's become a big deal personally to Xi Jinping. Since about 2016 or 17, when the current government in, uh, of President Tsai uh, took office in Taiwan, he has become more and more vocal and committed, President Xi Jinping of mainland China, to reunification. And the Chinese have been triggered by anything that implies nation state status to Taiwan by the US arms sales that are uh, certainly mandated, almost required by the Taiwan Relations Act to contribute to the self-defense of China, by any public embarrassments where the wrong name is used, it, heck, if an NBA official or player says something wrong, China goes pretty uh, ballistic about this. But like it or not, these sensitive, sensitivities are real. And they are provocative to China. And there is the potential they could provoke a conflict with global ramifications. Whew. That's, um, that is pretty simple. China wants to reunify Taiwan. They're prepared to do it by force and could do so. And the US would be drawn in. Let's take a quick break and ruminate on that while I tell you that I'll be back with another Figments, The Power of Imagination, next week. Don't have my guest locked down yet. I need to make a phone call as soon as I finish this webcast. Um, but I hope to have somebody who'll talk about imagining he could change the world. And certainly with regard to China and Taiwan, we need to change the world and change the dynamic a little bit. So. Um, how could war actually happen? What would happen to precipitate war? We've seen um, some rhetoric, words, not actions, trigger actions from China, specifically uh, massive overflights, the greatest ever of airspace in dispute. I'm going to avoid taking sides about whose airspace it is, but it's in dispute and has required a military reaction from the Taiwan Air Force, massive overflights of up to 150 aircraft. Um, and simply the potential for accident or misunderstanding could trigger conflict. Because there is a such internal interest in China in the reunification and largely generated by the Chinese government. Let me go into that a little bit. This, this issue, is a hot button throughout the People's Republic of China. The government has chosen to make it that. Um, again, not to legitimize or delegitimize it, but the, the flames have been fanned to some degree by the Chinese govern, government to make this a hot button issue. And as we see the government of President Xi Jinping uh, continue to solidify and expand its control over matters inside China, uh, this is one issue they have to deal with. They've kind of painted themselves into a policy corner where they've talked tough and to mollify the, the people, not in a democratic sense, but in an unrest sense, they see themselves as having to do it. And if there's an economic downturn or another cause for unrest, this is going to put further pressure to reconcile the issue of Taiwan. It could start by, <laughs> by inadvertent provocation from the United States, because I'm quite certain that the United States would never seek to foment comment of, or foment conflict on Taiwan. But we could make a mistake as President Biden last week did when he said we had a commitment to defend Taiwan. And um, do we have a commitment? Not specifically stated, 
we are required by the Taiwan Relations Act to contribute to the defense in preparatory manners. And we say that any transition must be peaceful in nature, but we didn't say we're gonna join the fight. By stating that in public, and the administration has walked it back as an error, but that is highly inflammatory to the Chinese. Equally inflammatory with statements of Chairman of the Joint Chief, Chiefs of Staff Milley, that we could absolutely defeat a Chinese military attack against Taiwan. Okay, that's first of all militarily debatable, not the purpose of this show, but those are things that don't need to be said in public and that, that we ought to stay away from. We don't need to foment, foment this problem. And, and yet another complicating possible provocation, uh, President Tsai acknowledged a very small military presence in Taiwan, been there for years. The Chinese, I'm absolutely certain, have a gazillion spies in Taiwan. They probably not only know the name of every US service member who is or has been in Taiwan in the last 20 years, they probably have a full dossier but it hasn't been publicly acknowledged. These missteps and public confrontations on Taiwan are incredibly dangerous because of the self-imposed pressure within China to do something about reunification. And once we get to some sort of a flashpoint, uh, I think you'll be looking at something that me and a friend who is an intelligence analyst has we worked on a report uh, while I was still on active duty called War Without End. The, the, and our belief no, was simply that once a war started in and about Taiwan, that it would draw in the US and it would cascade and spill over to the South China Sea and even Northeast Asia and become global in nature and, and be horribly uh, destructive to the world. Now, what about Milley's comments that we could defeat the Chinese, General Milley's comments? I've said many times that I could defend Taiwan with a rifle company. I think I could just in terms of the military sense, because the terrain is so rugged and what terrain isn't so rugged is highly urbanized. It's a very difficult place to fight. Again, we're not, this is not a military webcast, so I'm not gonna go, go in there, but we can learn something from history. And I'm gonna hold up this knife, okay? This is a ceremonial knife, Taiwanese hunting knife from the indigenous people uh, that I received in 2008. I actually watched it be made for me on the island of Kimoy or Chinmen, uh, very close to the mainland shore. And the reason that's significant is because it's made from spent artillery rounds from the second Taiwan Strait crisis. Go ahead and Google that because I, I don't have time to get into all the detail that I want to get into. During the second Taiwan Great uh, Strait crisis, which the US Secretary of State at the time called the uh, first serious nuclear crisis. And we're now many years later with a lot more nukes. Um, the uh, mainland Chinese uh, executed a sustained artillery barrage on the island of Chinmen, which is a lot smaller than Taiwan, but about the size of Oahu, if I remember correctly. How many artillery shells? about 500,000 rounds over four to five months, 500,000 shells. And Mr. Wu's knife shop there in Chinmen makes these artillery or these uh, knives out of spent artillery shells. And I watched by being made while mainland Chinese tourists were out in the, his storefront buying other knives made from shells that his country had, had provided to the island of Jinmen. It's an interesting twist on the swords into plowshares theme, but my point is 480,000 shells fired into a small island, they did not prevail. Modern war would be different 
but the outcome is likely to be the same, some sort of disastrous stalemate or at best for mainland China, a pyrrhic victory, one where the cost far exceeds the benefits. China has modernized and expanded its military in recent weeks. You've seen many reports about how surprising that is to some in US military leadership. Shouldn't be, <laughs> absolutely sh should not be. And one of the most troubling uh, elements of that expansion noted again just in the past few days is the very large expansion of their nuclear arsenal and uh, associated capabilities. So war would be different, not just because of that, that warfare stuff, but because of the gray zone warfare uh, that would come out of it where the conflict would at the same time be executed in um, in cyberspace, in space, uh, exoatmospheric space, in, in the economic domain. And that makes it more modern and I guess cool, but far more devastating globally. And means that nobody, no nation would be safe from the impacts of a war that involved the US, Taiwan and China. Um, so, is this going to happen? General Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, mentioned earlier, said uh, last week that in his assessment, they're not likely, China is not likely to attack, attack Taiwan in the next couple of years, said this at the Aspen Forum. What? <laughs> Excuse me? In the next couple of years? And to state that as a matter of fact? Holy crap! I mean, you got to be kidding me. The next two years, if we can't establish deterrence or understanding that goes for a decade, this is really bad. The next two years, that's all the chairman could, could offer up. I wouldn't say guarantee, but holy moly. I mentioned the president's statement about our commitment to defend and uh, when you add to that Chinese hypersensitivity about anything that we say about Taiwan or that uh, Taiwan does in and within Taiwan, let me go back to what I said to open the phrase, open the episode rather. And I'll read it so I get it right. The end of the world could begin in Taiwan. The end of the world could begin in Taiwan. This is more dangerous than North Korea. It's a bigger threat in terms of consequence than, um, than terrorism, global terrorism. And uh, it may not be as inevitable as climate change, but climate change won't matter if we allow a nuclear conflict to stem from misunderstandings in Taiwan. Okay. I really believe this. I've spent enough time in China working with Chinese friends and officials and quite a bit of time in Taiwan and looking at the U.S. national security landscape. And I just simply don't think there is enough appreciation for how serious and dangerous the situation is for China, Taiwan, and the U.S., the title of the show. So that gets me to what I have to say and why I'm making this webcast, this particular webcast, what would FIG do? I hope somebody's listening, folks. FIG would make peaceful resolution of the Taiwan question the top priority of US-China relations, period. Period. Has, has the greatest consequences. It should be a topic at every discussion of officials at every level. It's got to be some a touchstone that both sides have to go to to avoid the kind of miscalculation that I described that could have such disastrous consequences. <laughs> Having said that, they should do this in public and basically shut the or in private and basically shut the hell up. The this is not a discussion. The discussions on such sensitive issues don't do well under the light of day. This needs to be in the background, but but all the time, all omnipresent, but not visible. Um, has to be more quiet. 
both sides, one thing both sides should do publicly is acknowledge, state and restate that a forceful reunification would have no winners. And I think China has to see that. If, they're, if they use force, that's not a win-win, that's not a win situation for them. It should be a last resort. That's not good for anybody. We should say that a lot. Well, what should the United States do? We have a commitment to, to under the Taiwan Relations Act. We also have a commitment under the One China policy to treat China as the One China and acknowledge Taiwan as part of it. We ought to. We we ought to do that. Uh, maintain that commitment and state it as ambiguously as we can. Um, and, and not paint ourselves into a corner with China. Um, we need to understand and live with Chinese hypersensitivity. In the past, when I've talked to my friends in China or from China, it kind of drives me crazy, but the truth, it is what it is. We can't wish for an alternate reality. They are hypersensitive to all things regarding Taiwan, and we need to be careful of that. And if we're going to have difficult conversations, they should be done in, in private and directly. China, on the other hand, and I'm sure my Chinese friends will like me telling them what to do, but I got to do it because this is the what would Fig do part. If I were China, I would establish military hotlines in operational channels uh, with the United States, as Secretary of State Blinken recommended to Wang Yi in Rome last week. Okay. For all the friction between the US and Soviet Union, the hotlines were important. And uh, we have suggested this, we, the United States, several times to China. Now, as things seem more dangerous than ever, ever with regard to Taiwan, we've got to have those hotlines. I don't think this is gonna happen, but my second bit of advice for China is to moderate your internal commentary on Taiwan. It's not helping. It's not helping you. You know, I'm not a political con consultant in uh, the Communist Party of China, but just ratchet it down a little bit here, folks. And finally, the last thing I do is incentivize reunification because they're doing the opposite. So if they want to reunify with Taiwan, the statements of a Chinese official earlier that uh, people who've supported independence for Taiwan in Taiwan would pay the consequences after unification. That doesn't make anybody on Taiwan wish for the opportunity to be a part of mainland China. Neither does the example of Hong Kong. So with Chinese characteristics, they really ought to try to incentivize some sort of reunification. Okay, so that's the US should continue our commitment quietly. We ought to be understanding of their Chinese hypersensitivity. The Chinese would be good to ratchet it down and realize that there's no, no goodness for them in a kinetic military solution. They should incentivize reunification. What should Taiwan do? Man, I, I struggled with that preparing for show. I don't know. You know, <laughs> pray for the best because you're stuck between two very large and often very clumsy powers who don't at the current time seem to fully appreciate the potential conflicts of turning your beautiful island into a battlefield. I hope that changes. It's best for all China, Taiwan, the US and the world. That's my reality. Please join me next week on November 15th for Pigments, the Power of Imagination. As I said, we'll talk about changing the world. And I would like to thank, as I always do, Think Tech Hawaii, a great nonprofit that, uh, that puts this and many other shows on and gives us citizen journalists a chance to share our views with the world. So I'll see you next week on Pigments, the Power of Imagination in the following week pigments on reality. Please click like and send any comments you've got to info at phase minus one.com. That's all for now. Thank you and aloha. <laughs>